Hi everyone, today we're going to be looking at the As Is Residential Contract for Sale and Purchase and especially focusing on the 58 spaces that the contract provides which require you to make an entry. Now this presentation is designed for new realtors and especially for Keller Williams agents who are just starting out in their career. But this is a very basic look at the contract. Firstly, I want to just get a few things out of the way so that you can get your head around them. And the first thing is the concept of time in the contract. If you look on the left hand side, you'll see that the pages are numbered and there are 58 asterisks which require you to fill something in. Later in the contract, you're going to see where time is defined in the standards to the contract at line 420. Now, time and time periods are measured in calendar days. Calendar days, there's 365 of them in a year and 366 in a leap year. So every day is counted. However, if the last day of the period ends on a weekend or a public holiday as defined by statute, then the end of the contingency period will jump until 5 p.m. the next business day. An example would be if your inspection period ended on a Saturday. Saturday is not a day that a period can end on because it's a weekend. It would jump to Monday at 5 p.m. If your inspection period ends on a Thursday, that's not a holiday, it would end at midnight. So just to recap, calendar days run from midnight to midnight. The period would end at midnight unless the last day of the period is a weekend or a public holiday and the public holidays are defined. If it lands on a weekend or public holiday, it jumps to the next business day and ends at five o'clock. So another example would be if Monday was a public holiday and your inspection period ended on the Saturday, your inspection period would actually end on the Tuesday after the holiday at 5 p.m. So that's got rid of time. Now let's take a look at what offer and acceptance is and what the effective date is. If we go to the first page, you will see at the bottom of the page that the contract will be effective here at line 48, is when the last one of the buyer and seller has signed or initialed and delivered this offer or final counter offer. That will be called the effective date. So you have an offer, it's not effective yet. The seller receives the offer, they consider the offer and decide to accept it. They sign the contract and the addenda and then they deliver it back to the buyer. That would be the effective date of the contract. Not when the buyer receives it, but when it was sent by the seller. And the effective date for the purposes of counting contingency periods is day zero. So if your contract's effective on Saturday, then your day one would be Sunday. Day zero is your effective date. And all parties have signed and the last party has delivered it to the other party. That would be day zero and the next day will be day one. Now, once we've got those two concepts of time and the effective date, it makes it a lot easier as you go through the contract and understand all the things that you're going to write in those 58 spaces. Now to help you with effective date and to help you with calendar days and the definition of time, there is a handout together with this presentation and everything else that we produce is in the Facebook Broker Forum. The handouts will be in the files section of the Facebook Florida Broker Forum and the definition of time and an effective date calculator for you. That's all within the file section on the Facebook Broker Forum. If you don't know how to join that, please get with your agent services coordinator 
and they will be happy to show you how to do it. So let's get moving on the contract. There is a handout, again, that will be in the files section of the Facebook Broker Forum. I think we've established that. And on the handout, it tells you exactly what we're going to talk about today. So, asterisk one, parties to the contract. One is the seller and two is the buyer. Now, these can be a person or a legal entity, such as a trust or a corporation. They can also be an estate or someone signing as a power of attorney. And the way that we word this is laid out for you in the handout. So remember, an LLC can buy a property if its articles of incorporation allow it to. And the party to the contract would be Acme Explosives LLC, but the signature and the initials would all be by an officer of the company. You wouldn't sign it as Acme Explosives. You'd sign it as John Smith, who has to be an officer of the LLC in order to sign on its behalf. The next asterisk we get to is street address. Fairly simple. Street address, city and zip, located in which county is asterisk 8, and then the real property legal description. The legal description is found in on the deed or in the property appraisers website. Also, you can get it through MLS, through the various different systems that they have like IMAP. I suggest you copy and paste it so that you don't make any errors. If you make an error in the legal description, it can affect the validity of the contract later on. And what about if the legal description is too long? Best thing to do then is to put it into paragraph 20, if there's room there, which is the additional terms. And then in, in the asterisk line 9, you would put C additional terms or C attached exhibit and then put it on a plain piece of paper. And then in paragraph 19, there is a section which says other, and you would write exhibit one or exhibit a legal description. It would be part of the contract. So as you can see, paragraph one tells you what the property is and where it's located. It's really just highlighting exactly what it is that's being sold. Now we sell real property. We don't sell personal property. There is an allowance for a few items of personal property to convey. And the contract itself has some pre-printed items on here of personal property. What you will notice is that in these pre-printed, it doesn't mention washer and dryer. It's become a bit of a standing joke that most realtors in their life will end up buying a washer and dryer, either because they forgot to add it in the contract or it was added in there and the seller didn't realize. So if you look at all these appliances as refrigerators, dishwashers, disposal, ceiling fans, intercom, etc., etc., these are all pre-printed. There's no need to rewrite it down here. Refrigerators, there may be several refrigerators in the house, maybe a small refrigerator in the bedroom, maybe a large old refrigerator in the garage. So there's two ways of looking at this. All those have to stay with the property unless they're excluded below. Now the seller may want to take an heirloom drape that they own or an heirloom refrigerator that they've had since their college days. That would be excluded by the seller at line 23. Asterisk 23. Alternatively, the buyer may not want the dirty old refrigerator that's in the garage. Therefore, they can exclude that from the purchase by placing it into the offer. So be very, very careful with personal property, included or excluded. You can see that there's not many line space here to add lots of items, especially if you're dealing with a house that's going to become sold fully furnished, you refer to line 438 of the contract. It's, it is in the standards to the contract, which talk about 
how to convey personal property from one party to the other. And it describes that it has to be done by an absolute bill of sale. So my general rule is if you can't fit it in lines 20 and 21, then it should be done on an absolute bill of sale. And if you put in lines 20 and 21, all furnishings as seen on, you're creating uncertainty and a possibility that you're going to have some kind of controversy when you get to the closing table. Have the buyer and the seller write out an inventory on a plain piece of paper, call it bill of sale, have them sign it, and then you won't end up losing your commission because they're arguing about knives and forks, how many there were in the drawer on closing day. Also, if it's something which could cause a dispute as to whether it's real or personal property, and one of the most uh, prevalent items is the ring doorbell. The seller believes it to be theirs because it is personal to them. They sign into an account. It's just like a, a mini computer. The buyer thinks it's theirs because it's fixed to the property and forms part of the realty. Do yourself a favour. Explain to the seller if they want that ring doorbell to remove it or to exclude it on line item 23. If the buyer seriously wants this ring doorbell, then it might be best for you to put it into line 20 and 21. They don't cost that much money, but they have cost agents their commission when it's become an argument on closing day. And there's a lot of disputes about real and personal property. And frankly, the best test is it's real property if you need a tool to remove it. But if it just takes a small amount of effort to remove it, or it's on a bracket that just lifts off, then maybe the bracket is real property, but the item hanging on the bracket isn't. So the best way to do it is just to, to put it into lines 20 or 23. And that way you've done your service to your buyer or seller, and there isn't going to be a petty argument on closing day. Purchase price and closing in paragraph two. The buyer will always decide what the purchase price, and you'll give them information to help them arrive at that decision. Too high, if you would tell them to go too high, then they were going to be angry with you if they get the contract and then get buyer's remorse. And if they go too low and don't get it, then they're going to be angry with you because they uh, really wanted that property and upset the seller by a low ball offer. So let them make the decision, and then you are not the one that they're looking at when things go wrong. So on 26, you put the amount. See there is a dollar symbol. Every line down here, with the exception of line 38, has a dollar symbol. The direction from Florida Realtors is that you would put an amount in each of these places. Uh, there are some brokerages that will send the contract back to you if you try to put words in here like to be determined or balance to close because their brokers are uh, very adamant that they're not going to accept a contract that is not following Florida Realtors' guidance. We're not going to send contracts back in my brokerages, but my brokerages, when we send them out, we're going to do it correctly, and that is by putting a number where it asks for a number, and then words or a percent amount when it asks for it. So the initial deposit to be held in escrow, buyers are always going to ask you, how much shall I put down? Again, it's like the, the purchase price. You're not going to know whether or not you're right or wrong. There's no real standard for putting in escrow, what the amount is. But you need to explain to them that it's got to be enough to make the seller know that you're serious and not too much in case something goes wrong. So let them come to their own conclusion. You can say things like it's traditional to put in 1% or it's a traditional to put in 10% or whatever the uh, tradition is in your area. But be very careful not to direct them what to put because if they lose it, they're going to be unhappy with you. On line 29, it gives you the opportunity to tell the seller where the escrow is. Is it going to accompany the offer or is it going to be made within so many days to an escrow agent. Make a selection. Normally, we're going to be checking box 20, on line 29, we're going to be checking Roman numeral 2 because 
we don't handle escrow in nearly all Keller Williams offices in Florida. We do not handle escrow. We either send it to another brokerage, an escrow agent, or an attorney. And we find out where it's going to go by asking the buyer's agent prior to making the offer or taking a look in MLS and it should direct you as to where to place the escrow. Good, well-behaved, excellent listing agents are the ones that give you those clear directions. If there are no directions and you can't get hold of anyone, then place it with an escrow agent that you know. Ask someone in the office, who do we normally use for title services and escrow services? I'm sure that you've been in a team meeting and heard an escrow agent or a title agent give their presentation. And it can always be changed later on. The information on lines 32 to 34 is not the closing agent. The closing agent can be someone completely different. Nowhere in this contract is the closing agent or closing title company named. Here we're talking about where the escrow is going to be held. If you don't fill in the box here on line 29, it automatically goes to three days. I suggest you always put something in a blank, even if you're repeating what the default is. It makes, gives it clarity, and clarity is the power. What day is the third day going to be? If the third day is going to be a Monday, that means the banks have been shut for a couple of days and it may be in the best interest of your buyer that if you are effective, day zero on the Friday and day one is Saturday, day two is Sunday, day three is Monday, they've only got one banking day in which to get the escrow in. So you may want to consider an effective date of a Friday having it within four days. You could have it within five days. It is all part of the terms of your offer. If neither box is checked, it will always default to Roman numeral 2. So check the box. This is one of the uh, items which can get you into trouble. So three lines 32 to 34, the escrow agent information. They want the name of the company that's holding escrow, not the name of your favorite escrow agent, but the actual company name, like Sunshine Palm Tree Title Agency will be in here, not Fred Smith. The address, the phone, the email and fax, if they have one, should all be put in there because this is information not for you, it's for the parties to know. Not for you to know, you most probably know who the uh, where they're located and the, what the phone number is. But this is for the buyer and the seller's information. And it's a state requirement that that is filled out. Line 35 talks about additional deposit. Sometimes it's a good strategy to break the escrow into two parts. We have one part going in within three or four days of execution. And then maybe as an act of goodwill, you're going to give more escrow after the inspection period or after the loan approval period. Line 38 is financing. How much is your person going to be borrowing? And here you'll see there is no dollar sign. So they can actually have a percent amount in here. So if they're borrowing 95%, it would be quite reasonable to place that in this line. Other, they may be getting funds from another part. Uh, method. There may be an RV or a boat or something else that's going to contribute towards the purchase of the property and that will be written at line 39. And then finally the mathematical equation of all of this ends at a dollar amount here, not balance but a dollar amount of how much the buyer has got to bring to the closing table. Now, it's not going to be an exact amount, but it's going to be a ballpark amount because things change during the course of the transaction. And there may be differences in interest rates, differences in expenses that have been negotiated. But this gives the buyer 
a good idea of that they're going to have to bring maybe 6,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 to the closing table. What you don't want is uncertainty, because as I said, uncertainty is a problem with a contract. It's the death of a contract. So make sure that your buyer is fully aware that they're going to be bringing this amount of money, and it's not going to be a surprise to them later on. Line 45, this blank is for a date, and it's how much, how much time that you need to hear back from the seller once you've made your offer. And it gives the opportunity for a buyer to walk away and, ex and make this offer deemed withdrawn because there's uh, some situations where we might not hear back from the seller at all and the buyer wants to get on with their life and maybe go out and put some more offers in. So if it's not signed by the buyer and seller and an executed copy delivered to all the parties on or before this date, then the offer is going to be deemed withdrawn and the deposit, if any, is going to be returned. And it then goes on to say that offers and counter offers shall be within two days after the day that counter offer is delivered. And this is one of the exceptions to that the uh, if the last day ends on a weekend or holiday, because if it, obviously if you're doing offers and counter offers, it doesn't matter whether the last day of the two days is a Saturday or a uh, Sunday or a public holiday, they want to get the job done so that it doesn't jump to the next day. This gives the buyer protection from a non-responsive seller. It doesn't require you to go back and change it if they do consequently uh, go back in get into contract. It's a protection for that negotiation period. Closing date is required at line 52. Avoid using the words on or before. It says on here for a reason. The reason why the closing date has to be specific in a contract is because later on, you will see in one of the paragraphs, it talks about counting days back from closing date of 5 and 15 when the title commitment is due. If you haven't got a certain closing date, then how can you count back 5 or 15? I also suggest that you put the closing date in the contract last. Once you've filled out all the contract and worked out how long you're going to need for financing and then some buffer time, it would be a good idea to then work out the closing date after that because you don't want to end up having contingency periods end after your closing date. You know, buyers always want to close early, sellers want to get out of the house quickly, but there are, is work to be done, but especially by the lender and especially by the title company. It has to be done before the closing date, so we've got to give them enough time. And you'll see at the bottom of page one, there's space there for buyer's initials and seller's initials. So they would sign each page with their initials. Going on to page two, uh, here we're talking about the actual nuts and bolts of the transaction. There's two ex extensions of closing date mentioned here, and one of them is if paragraph 8b is checked and closing funds from the buyer's lender are not available on closing date due to CFPB closing disclosure requirements, then the closing can be extended for such period necessary to satisfy the CFPB requirements provided such period does not exceed 10 days. Well, there's a lot of words talking about a lot of stuff that very, very rarely ever happens. The uh, lenders and perhaps the, the selling agent may try and tell you that, that, that your delay in uh, getting funds is because of CFPB requirements. Double check, because it happens so very rarely. This is not a way to get out of uh, the underwriter to get to buy more time. There's a beautiful article written about it um, by a law firm in Sarasota, and I'd be happy to point you to where that is, and I think you know now it's in the files section of the Facebook broker forum. And then the second extension of closing date does happen now and again in Florida, especially during the hurricane season. We have the force majeure. French, word, French words for major force. That This is when it causes closing services to be unavailable. And that may be in Florida and it could be in Texas. If the lenders um, 
for the transaction is based in, in Houston and the hurricane is hitting Houston and they can't do, do their services, then the force majeure provision would apply to that. Every year we have some closings delayed because of hurricanes and you'll get plenty of information on that if and when it happens. And then you can go to the standards of the contract. We, we talked about the standards earlier on when we were talking about time. The standards are really a further explanation of what we see in the main bulk of the contract. We have the direction in the main bulk of the contract, and then the standards just go into it in a little bit more detail and give you definitions, a bit like an appendix to a book. So force majeure is dealt with in standard G. Then we talk about occupancy and possession. You'll hear some realtors that have been around a few years talking about swept clean or broom swept uh, when a property is closing on closing day. That used to appear in one of the old contracts, I believe, but it doesn't certainly doesn't mention anything about brooms or brushes in the 5X. So 6B uh, is asterisk line 68. If the property is going to be subject to leases or occupancy by someone other than the seller after closing, then you would check 6B. So if there's tenants in the property or it's an Airbnb and they've got bookings, vacation home and they've got bookings, you would check 6B. If it's going to be free and clear of tenants, the seller and property, then you wouldn't check 6B and 6A would be applied. So if 6A applies, then the seller at closing has got to give all the property with the keys, with the opening devices, free of tenants, free of trash. No swept clean anymore, just free of trash. And it's a good opportunity to talk about setting expectations with your buyer and seller. You know, you're going to talk to your buyer and say, look, come, come the closing day, I can't guarantee that this is going to be in perfect condition. Uh, all the contract says is that it's going to be free of personal items and trash. And that would incl include a, a burn pile in the backyard. So talk to them about that. If they want it removed, then let's make sure that we do good customer services somewhere where we can really shine and help them maybe. Um, maybe we talk about getting a cleaning service to go in on the day of closing. And if you're a listing agent and your seller is rushed and, and has got problems, then maybe you can step up and step in and help them with making sure that the property is nice and clean for the buyer to take possession of. Now, if it is subject of lease, then you will see some directions here that the uh, standard D here um, talks in about it further, but it talks here about what, how long the buyer and seller have got to, do, to talk about the leases for the tenants that are going to be in there or any leases for vacation rentals. And then you go to standard D, and which it talks about estoppel letters. Now, this is obviously um, a big time to warn you about writing anything at all regarding leases or occupancy. Leases are a deep bottomless pit felony if you start to write a lease. You're only allowed by law to fill in the blanks on the Florida Realtors pre-printed lease. You can't write any terms that talk about giving property rights from one person to another. And this may be not just about people, it could be about property too. So if you write something that says the buyer may bring a pod storage unit to the subject property three days before closing and leave it on the driveway, you have created a right of someone else's property to be used by someone else, which would be a felony. It would be an unlicensed legal practice. So if the buyer and seller want to do anything about pre-occupancy or post-occupancy, all we can do is fill out rider U for post-occupancy by the seller because 6B doesn't talk about the seller, it's talking about tenants. So if the seller's going to stay in there after closing, you would check um, rider U and you would end up um, having them go away to an attorney to get a lease drawn up, or they're going to write the lease themselves. Interest at 77 and 78 to talk about assigning a contract. 
it's normal for a person not to assign a contract. Sellers like to see the contract not be assignable. However, there are certain situations uh, where a person will ask to assign the contract and be released from further liability, or they may want to assign but not be released. There's a whole presentation that you may want to attend if you're interested in wholesaling where we talk about assigning contracts. It's normally not a good thing for the seller to allow box one to be checked. They normally, if they understand why, uh, box two would be checked. And that's normally where they're going to pay, make an offer on a property. And if they're successful in closing it, prior to the closing, they may want to put the property into an LLC. And this gives them the opportunity to, uh, say, like an investment property where they want to have the LLC as a street name, for instance. There's no point in starting the LLC with a street name until you know that you've definitely got the property. So one, two, three, high street LLC, no point if you don't get to close on 123 High Street. So they want to be able to assign it but not be released. It's fairly common. And then obviously the last one may not assign is the most common box to be checked at 77 and 78. Paragraph 8, financing. The whole theory behind the financing paragraph will be discussed in another presentation. But for today, we're going to talk about what's going to be filled in. At asterisk 82 would be if a buyer is going to pay cash. If they're not going to pay cash and they're going to get a loan, then on line 86, you would check box B at 86, and then the type of loan that they are applying for. And then at 87, the blank is 30 days for a loan approval period you will want to check with the lender how much time they need. They always say they can do it in 30 days, but you want to make sure you know that they're going to get it done in 30 days. In, in the market where there are a lot of loans and a lot of stuff being log jammed in the, in the underwriting department, then they may want 45. And some types of loans, for example, a USDA loan, may require more than 30 days for a loan approval to be obtained. 988, what type of mortgage, fixed adjustable or fixed or adjustable rate in the loan amount. And then an initial rate in 989 not to exceed whatever the rate is that the buyer is comfortable with. And if it goes over that, it gives the buyer the opportunity to cancel the contract. And if you leave it blank, it's going to be the prevailing rate based upon the buyer's credit worthiness. In a, in a very rampant and, and fluctuating market, the buyer may want to consider putting an, a figure in there if they haven't fixed their percentage early. And then uh, line 90, how many years is the loan going to be? And then line 91 is how many days they have to make the loan application. And these are all things that you need to be really forcing the buyer into <laughs> You say forcing, you really do need to force them to get on with their application because if the seller finds out that they haven't made application, they could cancel. And in a, in a seller's market, uh, the buyer wants to do everything they can to keep the seller happy. Buyer's failure to use diligent effort to obtain loan approval can be found out really quickly because this paragraph gives the rights to the seller and the seller's agents to contact the the buyer's lender to find out whether they have made application and whether the progress of the loan is going in the right direction and that they're making diligent effort to obtain the loan. As I say, this will be subject of another presentation, but for now, um, we're talking about filling in the blanks. Where the blanks that you fill in between 86 and 91 all form part of the protections that the buyer has and if they vary those items that they've placed in these lines then it should be done by an addendum to the contract so if they change the type of loan they, you need to have an addendum to the contract changing it to put keep the protections that paragraph 8 gives the buyer intact line 123 assumption of existing mortgage there are some mortgages that are assumable, very few, seen a couple over the years, um, but that would be something that the seller would advertise that you can assume my mortgage. 
And then a purchase money note means basically that the seller is going to finance it. And if you have a finance, seller financing, there is a rider specifically for seller financing, uh, which we'll get to in paragraph 19. And then we get to paragraph 9. There's a, a asterisk at line 131 and then one at 144. This is for this line here, other. Always check that. And when I say check it, inspect it to make sure that nothing has been put in there if you're the listing agent. And in the counter, you want to make sure that nothing's been put into the cost paid by the buyer on a counter offer. This itemizes how much uh, each party is going to be paying and what they're going to be paying it for. So just make sure those asterisks at 131 and 144 haven't got something written in there. And it might be a good idea for you just to put NA or zero in there. Entirely up to you, but always check it and make sure nothing's been sneaked in there. Line 145 will default to 15 if it's a financed and 5 if it's cash. This is the title evidence deadline. A lot of words here in, in 9C, but it's all about whether or not the buyer, the title company is going to give a title commitment. And we get that title commitment on a finance deal, 15 days, on a cash deal, five days prior to closing. And we need to make sure the buyer inspects it. That there's no exceptions to the policy. Then on line 158 is where the seller chooses to designate the closing agent and line 162 is if the buyer designates the closing agent and pays for the items that are in those two sub paragraphs. It's common in some counties for the seller to designate and, it's, and there are a few counties where the buyer traditionally would designate who's going to close it and pay entirely up to the parties, but one of them must be checked. The third box is for Miami-Dade, and the majority of people are, are going to be listening to this are not going to be working in Miami-Dade, and if you do work in Miami-Dade, you know exactly what this is all about. There are some additional rules and fees that take place down there, and it's explained in, in 9C3. Survey. On or before title evidence deadline, um, the uh, survey can be done. If a seller has a survey, they can give it to the buyer within five days of the effective date. No asterisks there. Asterisks at 173 and 174, all to do with the home warranty. So you can put in there if you're going to ask the seller to pay or if the buyer is going to pay for themselves. You're going to put which company is going to provide the plan. And then make sure you have the correct amount of how much the plan is. It's not a point in getting to the end of it and realise that you've put an amount that's not enough to cover the home warranty fee. 183 and 185. It's all about special assessments. Please look at what is in this parentheses. It's special assessments that do not include condo or homeowners association. This is one of these paragraphs that a lot of people get confused about. This is about a public body charging a special assessment. And they normally appear on the seller's tax record um, as a non ad valorem tax. So if there's a special assessment, you're going to have the seller's going to pay prior to closing, and then the buyer pay after, which is the normal one. And then B, the seller's going to pay it in full before closing. And examples of this are if they put street lamps into an area or a water line or a septic system has been upgraded to a sewer system, there may be a tax that's applied to the property in order to pay for this. And it only seems fair that the seller would pay up until closing because they get to enjoy it, and then the buyer's going to carry on with the payments afterwards. It's all negotiable, but A is the most common one that is selected. And then we get to the disclosures in paragraph 10. All the disclosures are here. And that section, paragraph 10, has radon, permits, mould, flood elevation certificate. It gives an asterisk. It's the only asterisk in, in disclosures, and it's where you're going to put how many days you're going to do your research for flood insurance. 
I tend to suggest you would put the same amount of time as your inspection period, which we're going to talk about in paragraph 12, because that will then force the buyer to do their due diligence about their flood insurance and whether the property is in a flood, special flood or hazard area. No more asterisks in paragraph 10. Make sure your buyer reads all the disclosures. There's a great document in the broker forum which explains all these disclosures in a little bit more depth. Uh, you'll see this one here. It says, energy brochure, buyer acknowledges receipt of Florida Energy Efficiency Rating Information Brochure. Make sure you give them a copy of that, the buyer, or point them to the uh, website with the Environmental Protection Agency, which has that brochure clearly for them on the internet. They're both paint, homeowners association, FERPTA, and seller disclosure. Paragraph 12 is where our next asterisk comes, and we're going to state how many days we need to do our inspection. This is an as-is contract, so the buyer can do it whatever inspections they wish, and they can do them themselves. They can have their Aunt Aggie do it, Uncle Bill can do it, but they have time to do these inspections, and you're going to find out how much time they need and then put it in, the, in this paragraph 12. With the as is contract, the, the buyer may cancel the contract at their sole discretion. So they can do inspections if they wish, or they don't have to do any inspections at all, and they can cancel for any or no reason. Interesting thing is that people get confused about this, and they feel that you have to do an inspection. And it's been confused over the years by people talking about the inspection in an as-is contract as a contingency. It's not a contingency, it's a period. It's a period of time that the buyer can do inspections if they wish and cancel if they wish. Next asterisk comes at way down the page. So let's just go back and talk about the inspection period for a little bit more. Um, we talked about they can do all these inspections, and then we can we then in this paragraph twelve it talks about the final walkthrough on closing day, and you can do a final walkthrough on closing day or the day before with your buyer. Your buyer has that right to do that, and they're going to make sure that the property is in exactly the same condition as it was when they made their contract effective and that all personal items of the property, personal property ha has been removed and it's been re kept in its as is condition. And then if um, they have bought personal property with the contract, then those items should be in there at that final walkthrough. It's always a good idea to do final walkthrough when the buyer seller has moved out so you can see what damage has been caused. During the inspection period, it's a good idea to do a permit inspection if that's important to the buyer um, and find out whether they have any building permits outstanding, whether there's any open or expired. The seller doesn't have to help at all with finance on a permit. There's no payment required to get a, pill, a, pipe, a permit closed out. But they need to give you as much assistance as, you, as they can for the buyer to close it out or any information about the open permit. They have to, if they know there are open or expired permits, they're supposed to disclose that right at the beginning of the contract. So do your permit searches within the inspection period because there's no right to cancel later on in the contract if you suddenly find out there are permits out open or, or uh, expired. The other thing to check out in the inspection period is the homeowners association. Make sure the buyer looks at all the bylaws and rules and regulations of the homeowners association because there's no right to cancel if they suddenly find out later in the contract when they do read the rules that there is a dog weight limit or a number of pet limit or no boats in the neighborhood. So do all your inspections and searches and research during that inspection period. Next, we go down to the standards and 
standards, what we talked about earlier on, it's where there's further explanation of the contract. It's all like the appendix. It's going to give you a little bit more meat on the uh, what the certain things mean, like the estoppels for the rents, etc., etc. And then you'll see here at line 420 is the definition of time that we talked about, calendar days, last day ends on a weekend or holiday. Give the standard G, the force majeure, we talked about in paragraph 5B. And then personal property be conveyed by an absolute bill of sale, this last little sentence here. We talked about that on, from page one. Read these, understand what they are, because it can help you when you have a question from the other side, you'll be able to point the other agent to a, a section in, in, the, in these, this area to help you get this thing to the closing table. Lots of good stuff in here. Have a read of it, and then when we do more in-depth classes, we can talk a lot more about the standards and about the disclosures. But for now, we're filling in the blanks. So just take a look here as the FERP to tax withholding. Nothing to worry about here. Just just remember that in a second when we go to the addenda. Here we are, paragraph nineteen, line five sixty nine, addenda. You will note there is no FERP to Addenda here. No addendum related to FERPTA. These addenda, which is a plural of addendum, relate to items that you're going to want to use as tools in your offer. There is a FERPTA rider out there, but it is not for this contract. And you'll see them now and again uh, that the other agent will use this far bar contract. Uh, the the five bar five x here, Florida Realtors Florida bar five x, and they'll try and give you what is known as the crisp rider. The crisp contract doesn't have the FERP to words within the body of the contract, but the Florida Realtors Florida bar contract does, and therefore does not need a rider to go with it. So if you get a rider that is not for this contract. The advice is to reject it. Florida Realtors are very clear. They twice recently put out articles saying, please do not mix and match riders from one contract with another contract. If you read this, it says here, the following additional items are to be included in the attached addenda or riders and incorporated into the contract. And if it's checked, then it must accompany the offer and you will not be effective until a checked rider is delivered. So if you've checked the, uh, let's pick one, if you've checked the lead-based paint disclosure and for buildings, uh, residences built before 1978, but it's not with the contract, you've not got an executed contract until that has been signed and delivered. Paragraph 20, asterisk here, additional terms. Don't write anything in here without good, solid advice. You may be practicing law without a license. You can put items in here like a request for closing costs or prepaid items, but please don't put anything more in there. The temptation is to write a lot, but generally, there will be something up here that will fit the circumstances. The one I see the most is sale of buyer's property. Someone will write in paragraph 20, this contract is contingent upon the buyer selling their property. Don't need to write that. You can just check V and use the rider, which is adequate and written by people that are a lot smarter than us. So uh, use the use the riders rather than put words in there because th those words, as I say, will be maybe a felony, unlicensed legal practice. But asking for things like closing costs, prepaid items paid by the seller is perfectly acceptable. 589, 
is the seller, if the seller wishes to counter the offer, they can check there and send it back with the counter. If they reject, they may check there and reject it. In practical terms, that's very rarely used. There's no requirement to use it, but it's there if you want to use that uh, to make sure the parties are happy and kept well informed. But generally it's counted in a text or is an email. Um, and until it's, the counter has been brought into the body of the contract and the contract amended, we have yet to have an effective contract. And then the big block capitals at line 592, this is intended to be a legally binding contract. If not fully understood, seek the advice of an attorney prior to signing. They're going to read that normally at the end. So it's most probably a good idea to take them to the last page first of all and just explain that to them. This is a form that's been approved by Florida Realtors and Florida Bar, and it allows you to fill in the blanks. And at line 599, it tells you an asterisk following a line number in the margin indicates the line contains a blank to be completed. The advice I gave earlier on is complete it, even if it says if left blank, just put something in there. It adds clarity to the contract. And here we go, a load of asterisks here where people are going to be signing. And then 606 and 607, the addresses for the buyer and seller. We normally use the real estate office address. There's, there's no, no requirement for the buyer to reveal their home address to the seller. And then the places here for the agents to sign. The, the, don't put my name in here or your broker's name. Put the actual company that the broker is. And don't just put Keller Williams. Put Keller Williams Legacy or Keller Williams Advantage. Whatever your brokerage is where your license is hanging, put it there. Because in four or five years' time, when we have to go to court on something, we want to make sure we were very clear as to who the agent was and what brokerage they were under when they wrote this contract. And that is the 58 spaces of the as-is residential contract.